right, it's good to see everybody here today. And that was quite an introduction. I'm not really used to that, to be honest with you. And I uh, appreciate that, though. Uh, with John Maxwell's team, I do uh, guest speaking a lot of times in different venues, such as hospitals and real estate companies, where we'll have maybe eight to 10 employees you know, uh, around the table. And we do these things called lunch and learn. And uh, so we bring everybody, you know, Chick-fil-A or Wendy's or something like that in, and, and um, they'll be sitting there eating, and, and I'll be talking, and you'll be surprised what a guest speaker can get by with when everybody's eating and you're talking. So, uh, so anyway, good to see everybody here. I totally enjoy uh, this morning's uh, presentation by uh, Elizabeth Drury. That was awesome. I shared with her a little bit ago that my church in Easley is uh, planting a new church in Greer at this time that will be launching in uh, uh, January of 2020. And we're really excited about that. So uh, I really would like you to pray about that sometime. But just a little bit about who I am. I am a speaker for John Maxwell, and uh, I do a lot of facilitating and a lot of coaching uh, through that ministry. And I also pastor United Western Church, a church that I love over here at Easley. And one good thing about that is I get to uh, work with students that you are training here at Southern Western. And uh, so uh, we have quite a few students that come over there, and they go through our supervised ministry programs and uh, to help them in their uh, quest for a degree. And uh, so that's the one thing that we've noticed about every student that comes there. Everybody is different. They all come with their own culture, their own personality, and they're coming into a church that has their own strategy and vision, but everybody's bringing something different. And so part of the job, really, for us as pastors is trying to get everybody that's coming into this to connect and so that we can make sure that culture that they bring in does not eat up our strategy. And uh, so we're going to talk about that in a little bit. And then just here recently, I started uh, working with uh, uh, Tom Harding and the district uh, administration. Tom is our district superintendent. And uh, I am now, we renamed everything, not the assistant superintendent, but the director of operations. So uh, I was uh, uh, sharing a little bit ago with, uh, with a few of you that it was a blessing today because this was the day that I'm supposed to be in the district office over here, uh, working with my wife as the administrator over there. And uh, so I, this is really a great thing and, uh, to be here to speak. I want to thank you, Karen Lee, for the invitation and working with you in this process. But, you know, it's, it's been awesome, though, to see the growth of Southern Western University since I've been in this area. I've been here since 2007. And I drive up and down these roads a lot. And, uh, man, it just seems like for a long time there, every month, you can look over here and see something different. You can see the running track see the scoreboard. You can see uh, the golf uh, course out there. I'm an avid golfer, so I go by there once in a while and stop and put some change in that machine and uh, hit some golf balls. In it. But it's just so good to see that. But I want to just start out by sharing a couple things that uh, Elizabeth Drury talked about this morning. She talked about how all of us are different and uh, how we should let God use us. She talked about this Southern culture that uh, we're involved in right here in Central South Carolina. And I come from a culture a little bit different. I was born and raised in West Virginia. And uh, man, I tell you, you talking about a different culture. I was in that church climate up there for 16 years. And uh, it was a legalistic climate. And so I came in there with my eyes wide open as a uh, free will Baptist, to be honest with you. That's where I came from when I came into the Western church. And so after I was in my first pastorate, I went to a church called Huntington First Western Church in Huntington, West Virginia, and uh, spent 10 years there. But during that time, we had a district superintendent changeover, and the gentleman's name that came to uh, be with us was Dan Finch. I don't know if many of you remember Dan Finch. I'll yeah, see a couple names. Dan Finch and I became best friends, and uh, Dan was a mentor, a personal coach of mine. I became his assistant superintendent as he came into this legalistic culture. He came in there for one reason. This place needs change. It needs change, and it needs change quick, or we're going to lose more churches. So I remember what happened is that Dan Finch came in here with this strategy and vision into an already established culture. 
This is the way we've always done things. That's what culture is. This is how we do things. So what happened, nothing changed until something changed the culture because culture always trumps strategy. Whatever that culture is, it's going to win the day. Well, Dan Finch came in and told me his vision, told me his plan, said, can you get behind this? I said, absolutely. But something had to change in that culture for this vision and strategy to work. Here's how it changed. I remember the day. It was in 1995. And I got up behind the lectern like this at our district conference. And I said this. I said, our conference action committee has met. And we hereby propose that any reference to jewelry, hairstyles, clothing, any, any reference to that, we make a motion to get rid of it, and we're all on the same page here. We're starting out on a new plane. 16 people stood up and started going like this. Ah, oh, we knew this was going to happen. Get these young preachers in here, and everything's going to change. I mean, me being the diplomatic person that I am, I, thought, I said this, hey, guys, stop. You don't have to leave. Dan Vince grabbed me by the back of my belt and said, let them go, then we'll vote. <laughs> <laughs> and that's exactly how the culture changed in West Virginia. When, every, when all those people left and we voted. And so, you know, I wanted to share that because when culture and strategy needs to kind of be on the same page if it's going to be totally successful. And so there was a clash of culture. And for us to be successful, I think that we have to make sure that we're gaining ground every day where culture and strategy becomes more similar than different. But anyway, I wanted to quote uh, Mrs. Drury when she said that we have the great responsibility here as educators to set the atmosphere that our students step into. And when she said that, I said, amen, amen, and amen, because that's who's responsible, I think, for the culture in our groups, our leaders. And that's who you are here today. So I want to talk about, you have a worksheet there, and we're going to run through some slides. We shouldn't be too off along today. You should have a handout that we'll look at some things there. And um, but the first thing I want to mention is, has anybody else recognized or noticed the pace of change in our world the last few years? Are, are things really changing, or is it just me? I mean, things are really changing in our world. I recently read an article called The Organizational Pace of Change. How to Survive and Thrive in Our Fast-Paced World. And it, it went on to talk about how people have a new way of living. We have a new way of living in 2019. But leaders need to learn to be flexible in learning new ways of leading. And uh, I have a, a couple slides here. And by the way, my green light's not on here anymore, so you may need to do that yourself. The first slide is this, change back then. Do you realize it took 68 years to reach their first 50 million customers in airline? In the automobile industry, it took 62 years to reach 50 million drivers. It took the telephone 50 years to reach 50 million users. It took electricity 46 years to reach 50 million users. That was the pace of change back then. Now check this out. Within 14 years, 50 million people were using computers. Within 12 years, 50 million people were using mobile phones. Within seven years, 50 million people were using the internet. Three years, it took that many people to use Facebook and watch this. Within 19 days, 50 million people were playing Pokemon Go. I don't know about you, but it kind of looks like that change is happening at a pretty fast rate right now. So I want to introduce you uh, to a new book that uh, Dr. John Maxwell just recently wrote. And the workbooks are just now, uh, they're not even out yet. This is just a, the first showing of this book called Leadership. And this book, uh, of all the books that Maxwell has written, I feel like this one here points to our times now more than anything that he has written. And it's about how 11 essential changes that every leader must embrace. And uh, he goes through there and talking about due to the fast pace of change in our world, 
that leaders need to think differently. They must shift their leadership. It's called leader shifting. And to define that, Maxwell goes like this. He says, leader shifting is the ability and willingness to make a leadership change that will positively enhance organizational and personal growth. It's, it's having the adaptability and the willingness to make changes due to the changing culture. And here's one quote in that book right here. He says, you cannot be the same, think the same, and act the same if you hope to be successful in a world that does not remain the same. This world is not remaining the same. And for us as leaders, our role is to continue growing and changing and adapting. But you know, the fact is that our culture in our world has changed. It is changing, and it will continue to change. So where it leaves us as leaders, we must make sure our culture is in line with our strategies. We must make sure deep down in, in the cultures that I'm talking about now are the cultures that you lead in your classroom, in your division, or in your church, or wherever it is, that we have to make sure that we have strategies that are matching our culture that we have in our groups. Let's take, for example, Southern Wesleyan University, our, your mission statement. It's on the worksheet there. The mission and strategy say this. Southern Wesleyan is a Christ-centered, student-focused learning community devoted to transforming lives by challenging students to be dedicated scholars and servant leaders who impact the world for Christ. And uh, then also, uh, it says it on the screen there, but also on your worksheet, it's not on there, that it says, a Christian university where inventive learning and transformative experiences happen through faith-filled community. All right, so when I look at that, and all I did was a Google search. I just Googled Southern Western, up comes the website, and I find these two very important pieces of information. So now the tough question for all of us, and mainly you, because you'll be going back into your classrooms and your offices in the next week, the tough question is this. Is the culture of your group, your division, your area of leadership, is it playing into or moving away from the smooth mission and strategy? That's where it has to, it has to be laid. Where do we, in the culture of our groups, you might say, well, Tim, what does culture mean? That's a very good question. What does culture mean? It's on the slide. Culture is a word for the way of life of groups of people, meaning the way they do things, and different groups may have different cultures. Now, let's talk about this for a second. A culture is passed on to the next generation by learning. <laughs> but genetics are passed on by heredity. Culture is this, all the stuff that glues organizations together. Has anybody heard of, ever heard of, y'all call him Smirnoff? I, I think he's one of the funniest people that ever lived. Listen to this story. When he came to America from Russia, comedian. He said, I'll never forget walking down one of the aisles of the grocery store and seeing powdered milk. And he said, man, just add water, you get milk. And then he said, right next to it was powdered orange juice. Just add water, and you get orange juice. And then I saw the baby powder. <laughs> and I thought to myself, man, what a country this is. And you know, when I think about that, I think, yeah, that's how we are. You know, we're an instant culture. We do things in a fast way. And, and he knows it too. Just here in the last, uh, for, for the last eight days, we, we returned on uh, Sunday evening. My wife and I did from Martha's Vineyard. And we've been going there now for the last four or five years. And, uh, and it's interesting, the culture, when you get on to Martha's Vineyard. The first thing we did when we walked into our house that's owned by my sister-in-law, she uh, said, here, she said, left a note, said, here's two golf tickets. And she knew that we loved golfing. She said, uh, my husband's a member of this little golf course. It's over on the Chappaquiddick Island. So we found out where Chappaquiddick was. 
We got over there to the edge of Edgar Town and got on that little ferry. It took about a two minute ferry ride, and pretty we got off. We took our jeep off of there, got right on the island. Now this little golf course, it's a Lynx course. I said, wow, I've never played on a Lynx golf course before. I've always played on these South Carolina courses and uh, here and there, and, and I've never played on a Lynx course. We got there, we got on this dirt road, and we finally found the golf course. It was in a real rural area of Chattanooga. <laughs> and we couldn't even find it. We finally found it, got in there, and I, I had already told the guy on the phone that I'm left-handed, I didn't bring any clubs here, I need to rent a set of golf clubs. You have that many clubs? He said, yes, we have one set of electric clubs. I said, okay, Tim Jones, I, I need them. I didn't ask the price or anything like that. So got out of the Jeep. My wife already uh, went in there and got her clubs, which were right-handed. Everybody has right-handed clubs, but not too red left-handed clubs. Got in there and never saw anybody in the clubhouse, which, by the way, was a little shack, about 12 by 12. And I started looking around, couldn't find anybody. And finally, one golfer came by, and I said, hey, do you work here? He said, no, I'm just a golfer here. I said, well, I called in here reserve clubs. He said, just couldn't take much one. Matter of fact, there's cold drinks in the refrigerator, things like that. And I said, man, this is not the thing. This is not how we, we should be acting here. You should be saying, we're, we're needing $200 for a round of golf, and our drinks cost $12 a piece. So anyway, at the end of the day, we played on this really old and really worn out golf course. And finally, I finally found somebody around, and I said, hey, I owe somebody some money. I said, I didn't take any drinks, although I was told I could. I didn't do that, but I did rent these golf clubs. They said, oh, we're free. Don't worry about it. So the lady just told me, go ahead and unload the refrigerator. If you want anything out of there, there's iced tea, there's water, whatever you want. And I started thinking, man, this is a different type of culture that you guys are operating here that's really not the same as the rest of the island that we've been enjoying the last week and a half. And so, uh, and by the way, just a little something to throw in there. At one of the restaurants there this year, went in to eat breakfast, and I just didn't see him on the menu, but I was courageous enough to ask the lady if I could get a bowl of grits. And she looked at me, and she said, well, we have oatmeal. I said, well, oatmeal and grits are really not the same. And so I ended up having oatmeal. But, you know, when you get into a different culture, a different – matter of fact, we came off of that golf course, but that was one that I probably wouldn't want to pay $10 to play on if it was here in South Carolina. And a half a mile down the road on our way out, we got stuck in a traffic stop because President Obama was on the golf courses on the road. And I thought, wow, what a culture this is. Talk about diversity. They let a West Virginia come on here and play almost free. And then we have our former president coming down here and paying who knows what play golf. So everywhere you go, there is a different culture. So, so, so what I'm saying here is that culture is the way that we do things. It's our, it's our way of life. And there's a slide you're going to see that asks the question that says, what if this were true? Most organizations or groups are one move away from a breakthrough. What if that was true in your setting? What if that was true in your division or your classroom, in your ministry? What, what if that was true? If that one move, could that be something about changing your culture? Could that be something about adding or taking away from the way you do things? What would happen if you added to the way you do things this year? What would happen if you took away from something in the way that you do things? Do you know right now what that one thing is? What's one thing that can make your, the culture better in your atmosphere, in your environment? What can make it different? And is group culture even important? Does culture trump strategy? This next slide will show you what Peter Drucker wrote. He said that culture eats strategy for breakfast. Culture eats strategy for breakfast. There's also a corporate advisor on uh, Wall Street named Nilo Merchant. Here's what he said. He said, after working on strategy for 20 years, I can say this, culture will trump strategy every single time. The best strategic idea means nothing in isolation. If the strategy conflicts with how a group of people already believe, behave, or make decisions, it will fail. Wow. He said, conversely, a culturally robust team can turn a so-so strategy into a winner. 
The how matters in how we get performance. Yes, it does. I was just thinking here recently that culture is the reason why I have a favorite hotel that I like to stay in when I travel. You know, it's, 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 it's how they serve you. It's how they greet you. It's all those cookies and popcorn they have laying out that's free of charge whenever you feel like you just have a nurse eat something. Culture is why you like shopping in some stores like Bass Pro Shop or Costco or Ikea. And you despise shopping in some other stores. It's probably to do with the culture. Culture is why I love to eat at Logan's Roadhouse. I mean, not many places you can go into and eat peanuts and just throw the shells all over the floor. I mean, we get chewed out for doing things like that at home. But you can just go in there and just eat peanuts and just throw anywhere you want, and nobody cares. It's all about the culture. Culture is why some families always have fun when they're together and why some cannot stand to be in the same room with each other. It's the culture. It's the environment. It's the atmosphere. Clemson football, man, you, we could talk all day about that, about the culture that has happened here in Clemson football. Now, I don't know much about their strategy that Clemson had, the Clemson University strategy. I don't know much about that. But I do know a little bit about the culture of Clemson football. I do know that it's pretty exciting on a big game to sit there and it starts at five minutes till five. And it starts at five o'clock at about five minutes till five. ESPN has the cameras glued on that bus going around the stadium with the coaches and players on there getting ready to come off. Man, I don't know about you, but I came into this thing as a West Virginia fan, and and, uh, and West Virginia Clemson had a pretty big ball game there about six years ago, and in that Orange Bowl, where you, and I paid a big price for bragging about that too much, and how that turned out. But it's pretty exciting now to see Clemson come around there on that school on that bus and jump off of there and run down and touch that rock. They touch Howard's rock. Can you imagine how much different it would be in that culture if they quit going that? They just said, okay, this year we're not going to touch the rock. We're not going to drive rail on the bus. We're going to come out like most other teams, just come out of the tunnel, go on the field and play football. No, it's all about the culture. Culture trumps strategy. Culture will eat it for breakfast. Think about Chick-fil-A. I mean, Chick-fil-A has an interesting culture. Man, does anybody been reading about that macaroni and cheese that they have out there now? How many of you have heard about that so far? Man, how many of you have had it so far? Wow, two or three guys. Yeah, most of them. Yeah, no, no calories, right? But you know, it's all about their culture, and I, I, I've studied a little bit about the Chick Fil A culture, and that this is one thing that I, you know, we have to try things when we can. And I'm trying to teach, to lead my staff in a way that at our church we become like the Chick Fil A culture, because their three selling points of this culture is pretty simple. Number one, you make people the priority. People become the priority in this Chick-fil-A culture. Matter of fact, Truett Cathy famously said, we aren't in the chicken business. We are in the people business. We're not in the chicken business. We may sell sandwiches, but we're in the people business. And then the second part of that culture is that uh, we do things uh, in an uncommon way. You might think, what kind of, what's uncommon about their way of doing things? Well, how many other restaurants do you go in and ask somebody working there to do something and they look at you not like you just saw a turnip truck, they look at you and they say, my pleasure. It's the culture. Culture trumps strategy. It eats it up. And that's probably part of the reason why the Chick-fil-A was recently named the number one fast food restaurant in America. It's my pleasure. Can I have another diet of caffeine free coke? Pleasure. Matter of fact, somebody wrote a book. Deanne Turner was the author of It's My Pleasure. And she said on a podcast recently, she said, when a guest says thank you, what you hear back from our employees is my pleasure because what it really means is it's my pleasure to serve our company, to serve our customers. She said Chick-fil-A cares about you personally when you walk into their, our stores. It's a genuine care, not manufactured. The service mentality is embedded in our culture all the way from hiring through day-to-day -day execution. And one of their presidents recently said, if you aren't serving chicken, 
you better be serving someone who is. Wow. It's all about the culture. It's about what's happening and how we do things. And, and the third thing about Chick-fil-A's culture is they are driven by purpose. You know, I didn't know this till recently, but in 1982, Chick-fil-A had hit its first ever sales slump. And instead of making major mark corporate cuts, Truett Cathy and his executive team came up with a corporate uh, purpose statement. Here's what it said. To glorify God by being a faithful steward of all that's entrusted to us and to have a positive influence on all those who come into contact with Chick-fil-A. So the takeaway for me for Chick-fil-A's culture is I think that what's important to them, everybody knows their organizational purpose and they communicate it relentlessly. They know what that company is all about and that's what they communicate. I mean, they, Chick-fil-A empl employees are all in to the strategies of the organization. I mean, what would happen if all of these Chick-fil-A employees come out Monday morning and they just said, we're going to change something around here. We're going to do it our way now. And they started this maybe an isolation campaign, do it our own way. Well, that happened once. Not, not at Chick-fil-A, but at another company. And another company that I've done some research about is Southwest Airlines. And as a matter of fact, my wife worked in the uh, airline industry for 23 years as a journalist. And uh, she met this man that's the president of, um, of Southwest Airlines. And he wrote this book called Nuts. Matter of fact, I would highly recommend it. If you want to learn a little bit more about company culture, this book here is also called Nuts. But anyway, what he based his whole company on when he transformed uh, Southwest Airlines was two things. Number one, we are going to have fun in our organization. If you don't like to have fun, don't apply. You, 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 we're going to have fun. That was their, that was the vision and the culture. And then the second thing is, he says, we're not going to serve meals on our airlines. But what they do is they serve 70 million bags of peanuts every year on their airlines. He said, we're going to have fun and we're going to give away nuts. And so he based his entire strategy about those two things. He said, well, number one, we want our employees to love working here. And we want our customers to enjoy flying with us. And it worked. But, the, but what I'm saying is with, with culture, it's all about strategy. But if we don't have the right culture within our groups, within our total overall purpose, then culture will be strategy launch. So why is it important? Why is it important? Another slide will ask that question. Why is it important that we as leaders pay attention to our organizational culture and how others are seeing it played out? Why is this important? Dan Ryland recently wrote me these words. He said, your leadership culture needs to matter. Leadership culture needs to have intentional cultivation because culture is the strongest force in our organization. And it does trump vision and strategy. So he bought into this Peter Drucker thought that culture trumps strategy. So why is it? Why is this so important? I've got three points there. And if you want to look at those, you'll see A, B, and C. The first one is this. How we perceive the culture does not matter. What the customer thinks makes all the difference. How we perceive the culture does not matter, but what the customer thinks makes all the difference. And then another reason I think is letter B, and there's a slide that says this, a bad culture will consistently undermine mission, vision, and strategy. And then that letter C says something like this. Remember who it is that our culture reflects. So the third reason why it's important to keep an eye on this is we have to remember who it reflects. So who does it reflect? It, it reflects us as leaders. Matter of fact, 
a very, very experienced district superintendent told me in my eighth year of pastoring. I was in my eighth year at the same church. I had one pastor that was six years, my next pastor was 10 years, and I'm, now I've been 12 years at this same church. And here's what this DS told me. He said, after three years of pastoral leadership, look out into the congregation and you will see yourself. You know, it took me a long time, Mark, to, to really believe that. He said, after three consecutive years in your congregation, look out to your congregation and you'll see you. And I asked him, I said, why is that? He said these words, people will buy into you and the culture or they will find another. People will buy into you, your vision and the culture or they'll find another one. And now that's, I'm talking about church ministry now. Because church ministry is volunteer. People will go to church where they feel like they connect. So I think now, after 25 years of pastoral ministry, I think it's true that when I look out on a Sunday morning, I'm seeing people that have bought in to this environment, to this experience, to this strategy, and now they are part of it. And he went on to say this. He said, Tim, remember, make sure you are leading a culture that is worth reproducing. Make sure that you are leading a culture that is worth reproducing. So that brings me to this final section here. How can we create a culture that is worth reproducing? How can we as leaders in the education system, in Christian education, in ministry. The first, number one, says this. Seek out and get, a, get rid of anything toxic. Seek out and get rid of anything that is toxic. See what those words say? I believe this. A toxic culture is like carbon monoxide. You really don't have a warning. You just wake up in. That's what toxicity in our culture does. And here's a couple of thoughts that go along with that. Group culture isn't necessarily healthy because people aren't naturally healthy. Every one of us have our, have our ways, our own culture. Every one of us have things that, uh, uh, that may be negative to somebody else's experience. So a group culture isn't going to be healthy because Naturally, because naturally people are not healthy. And another thought that goes along with that is as a leader, one of our responsibilities is to figure out why our culture is not healthy and change that. Why is it that we're not having a healthy environment here? Another thought is look for toxins that bring an unhealthy culture. Now, I'm speaking from my own personal experience. But I think they may fit just about anywhere. But I know of four things that will bring a toxic culture into who we really are. Number one is conflict. Selfishness. Personal agendas. And here is one that in the church culture, the church environment, I think, is number one. A lack of passion for our mission. A lack of passion for our mission can be lethal. So once again, lack of passion, personal agendas, selfishness, and conflict. And that quote that's up here on the next slide says something like this. Carrie Newhoff says, you can't eliminate anything that you won't identify. So identify anything you want going from your culture. So as leaders, we have that in front of us. We're, and I believe what Mrs. Drury spoke about, that we have a great responsibility of setting the atmosphere. So we can't eliminate anything that we don't identify, so, don't, so identify anything that you want going from your culture. All right, number two. Number two says something like this. As a leader, B 
Be the culture that you want to see. Be the culture that you want to see. Going around our church circles, I do know this, that many people will say that our churches will only be as healthy as its leaders. I totally agree with that. Expecting a group to be healthy when it's not, when its leader isn't, is like expecting an athlete to run a marathon on the missing part. It's not possible. So any conversation about a healthy culture should start in the mirror for the leader. I need to get up on Sunday morning and look in that mirror, look deep into my eyes, into my soul, and identify anything that's toxic. Identify anything that's keeping me away from being not just good, but the best that I can be. And then the third thing I think is really important is that we should continue using the right language. And what I mean by that is by we need to keep repeating the key words of who we are over and over. And the key words that who we are at this point, as Southern Wesley University, we are a university that's Christ-centered, student-focused, learning community, devoted to transforming lives by challenging students to be dedicated scholars and servant leaders who impact the world for Christ. So maybe that's where we are. Maybe we need to continue thinking about who we are here. What are we doing? What's our purpose? Who are we representing? What's the end result goal? It's to turn out students that are going to be dedicated scholars, servant leaders who impact the world for Christ. So I hope that your culture, where, where you are responsible for, is feeding into that. So there, there are four questions there. And I would like for us to take exactly five minutes, and we're just up there. We'll just take about five minutes and just maybe be in just quietness. And all of us together, let's look at these. And I, I would like for us to just think about these four things. And then we're going to close here in prayer in just about five minutes, okay? So we're on the clock right now. Two and a half minutes.
Okay, I think that's close enough. Um, I hope that just that real brief exercise was good because what I just talked about in this last 45 minutes is I'll be speaking again on Saturday at our leadership retreat that our church is sponsoring. We have about 25 leaders that will be gathering for about a six hour conference. And, and I'm going to be speaking exactly this was brand new for me. So I hope it was healthy and, and, you know, for you. But I'm going to be asking the same questions to our leadership team and myself. What is good about the culture in our group? Like, what's good about it? And I'm sure we can think of a lot of good things. But what needs changed in our culture? What are some things that we probably should take away? What are some things we could add to? And am I allowing what is good to stand in the way of being great? Sometimes, man, we just have to get ourselves out of the way and just let something go away so we can be better than we thought we ever could be. And then finally, how does the culture of my group align with the strategies and mission of Southern West Indian University? How you do things, what you're all about. How does that align with what's going on? Remember, the Clemson culture, man, I don't know what their strategy is, but their culture sure is good. Their culture is winning. Winning the day, it seems like. The Chick-fil-A, I don't know much about their strategy, but I can tell you this, their culture is really winning the day. So I just want to leave those thoughts. And if you don't mind, could I just have a brief prayer? Lord, I just want to thank you for this great opportunity that you have given me, Lord, to stand here today. Have this privilege of speaking, speaking life to each one of us, Lord, myself included, about our culture and our strategy and how we can do things to help these cultures and these strategies match up so that we can have more effective ministries and more effective systems. So God, I pray, Lord, for the days ahead for Southern West University. I pray, God, that you just continue using this group, Lord, using this college to transform the minds and the thinking of students so they can go out and make a difference for Christ in this world. And God, I want to thank you for each one that's here in a personal way. I pray that each one of their lives will be enriched this year. And maybe some way, somehow, or somewhere, they can draw closer to you in those areas, Lord, that they struggle or they may have fear about. Just bless us, God. Be with each of us today as we travel. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.